In March this year, the football world was rocked by a shock announcement. FIFA, the sport's governing body, stripped Indonesia of the right to host the Under-20 World Cup, barely two months before kickoff. The reason? Widespread protests against Israel's participation in the tournament by Islamic groups in the country. The episode has sparked an examination of religion and politics in the world's largest Muslim country, long considered a bastion of moderate Islam. Kita ini masih ada di dalam masyarakat ini kelompok-kelompok yang masih sengaja hendak membuat masalah. As the country gears up for its presidential election in less than a year, how will politics and popularism shape moderate Islam in the archipelago? There's always been a small group who wanted to establish an Islamic state in Indonesia. Menolak daripada khilafah itu adalah kemurtadan. Menolak dari khilafah adalah haram. It's the Ramadan fasting month in Indonesia, the world's most populous Muslim nation. Since the 19th century, pilgrims from various parts of the archipelago have visited the tomb of Syed Hussein Abu Bakr al Aldris in the Luang Bata Mosque in Jakarta. Worshippers believe that al Aldris was a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad who came from Yemen to spread Islam in Indonesia. Umumnya sih paling yang minta keberkahan hidup, keberkahan supaya dilancarkan usaha. Ada juga yang minta jodoh, ada yang minta apa? Biar rumah tangganya adem, tentram, macam-macam sih. The tomb attracts four times as many pilgrims during the fasting months when Muslims abstain from eating and drinking between dawn to sunset. But this pilgrimage is controversial. It is seen by some Muslims as tomb worship, forbidden in the Quran. 51-year-old caretaker Mazwi takes this view in stride. Ya simple aja sih. Kalau memang mereka enggak percaya dengan adanya ziarah, ya silakan. Itu kan hak mereka gitu. Tapi kalau percaya, silakan lebih bagus. Karena pada intinya kan siapapun yang bernyawa itu pasti akan mati juga. Dengan niat kita memang benar-benar ngurusin masjid, ngurusin makam, yang so keberkahan itu pasti ada gitu. As the sun sets, pilgrims and locals break fast together before communal prayers. But the convivial spirit belies a tension in Indonesia, represented by the objections over the tomb visit. How should moderate Islam be expressed in the country? Moderate. Moderation it means not extreme, uh, either too liberal or too conservative. So it's really when you think of being moderate, uh, being taking a middle position, a middle path. Uh, Muhammadiyah calls it uh, Islam wasatiyah, Islam of the middle path. Uh, while Nadatul Ulama, as you know, has uh, promoted the idea of uh, Islam Nusantara, but it's very characteristic of uh, Islam in Indonesia. Nadlatu Ulama is Indonesia's and the world's largest Muslim organization. Founded in 1926, it recently celebrated its centenary, according to the Islamic calendar. Nadlatu Ulama boasts a membership about 120 million strong and promotes a moderate form of religion that has been called humanitarian Islam. So that is Islam which lives in context of its very diverse cultural background. As you know, Indonesia is extremely diverse with very rich cultural traditions and Islam came to Indonesia and have to adapt to uh, the context. So it has always been much more open, much more outward looking, very tolerant of differences and does not take extreme positions. 
moderat itu kan mudah diartikannya. Kalau orang sudah moderat itu pasti dia akan rileks saja hidupnya. Dia nggak menyalahkan orang lain yang berbeda, dia akan toleran. Dia tentu saja boleh merasa nilai-nilainya benar, tapi dia tetap menerima kehadiran orang lain yang memiliki konsep berbeda, gitu kan. The archipelago's first contact with Islam came through Muslim traders, mainly from India in the 13th century. Now, nearly 90% of Indonesia's 273 million people embrace the faith. But politically speaking, the country of 17,000 islands is officially secular. But recent years have seen numerous cases of intolerance against non-Muslims putting Indonesia's reputation as a bastion for moderate Islam and diversity into question. Misalnya, selama 15 tahun terakhir ini, kasus-kasus intoleransi itu hampir mencapai 500 kasus. Terutama menyangkut rumah ibadah ya. Pelarangan rumah ibadah, penyegelan rumah ibadah, penyerangan rumah ibadah, pembubaran orang yang sedang beribadah. Isu-isu keagamaan yang keras di kita ini dalam beberapa tahun terakhir itu membutuhkan pemihakan ya, pemihakan yang tegas gitu, pemihakan yang jelas. Nah, dalam konteks itu menjadi moderat saja tidak cukup. Dia harus menjadi inklusif, dia harus menjadi toleran. Itu problemnya saya kira. The state ideology Pancasila enshrines diversity, recognizing the country's other religions. I don't think we have to exaggerate the dangers of people who aspire to establish an Islamic State. You remember very well that when the founders of Indonesia uh, discussed or deliberated the Constitution back in 1945, one of the questions raised by the founders, whether Indonesia should become an Islamic State or not. Yeah? There was a very heated debate during that deliberations at the time. But as a political compromise, the founders issued what they called Jakarta Charter that acknowledged Islam as a religion where all the people belong to Islam have to comply with the Islamic teaching. But Indonesia is not an Islamic state. Indonesia is a state based on the rule of law. Indonesia recognized unity in diversity. Extremist groups were banned under the authoritarian rule of strongman Suharto, who was president for 32 years. But after his downfall in 1998, the political reform or reformasi that followed allowed more freedom of expression. It paved the way for hardline groups to emerge. Itu karena dulunya mereka ditekan. Ya kan? Kalau menurut hukum energi itu kan kalau satu kiri ditekan dia akan muncul di tempat yang lain. Sekarang ditekan, sekalian waktu akan muncul lagi. Begitu Pak Harto jatuh, reformasi muncul, mereka keluar semua, gitu loh. Reformasi open the door for anyone to set up political parties. And then you had so many political parties established in Indonesia, including Islamic political parties. If among them, they play identity politics, I'm not surprised at all. Because that's the way to get people vote for them. In less than a year, Indonesians will have to choose their next president as Joko Widodo's term comes to an end. If the last few election cycles are anything to go by, this politically charged period could see the rise in religious tensions as political parties lean into religious ideology. If you mention that religion could be used, I think definitely religion is something that is used in, in a political situation in Indonesia, especially if we go back to 2017 and 2019, where the politician used religion as, you know, uh, identity marker to, to get and to mobilize voters to, 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 to then, you know, to, to vote for certain kind of politicians. <laughs> With the anti-Israel protests and subsequent removal of Indonesia as host of the Under-20 World Cup, some worry that the politicization of Islam is picking up pace. Indonesia does not have formal diplomatic relations with Israel, 
as a sign of solidarity towards Palestine. As long as the Palestinian issue, for example, is not resolved, there are always going to be this uh, 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 perception that you know, Palestine, uh, fight for the Palestine would be a rallying cry uh, for Muslims worldwide, and some will take a more extremist view than, than, than others. Apart from the more hardline groups, moderates also got involved in the anti-Israel protests. Two influential governors from the same political party as President Joko Widodo, which is considered to be a centrist party, supported the Israel ban. Ganja Pranomo, the governor of central Java, and the governor of Bali, Wayan Costa. Perhaps to head up the hardliners, Nadlatu Ulama sought to reassert the importance of moderate Islam at his centenary. The organization put out a statement rejecting the idea of a caliphate, a single Muslim government across the Islamic world. Bahwa kita ini masih ada di dalam masyarakat ini kelompok-kelompok yang masih sengaja, ya sengaja hendak membuat masalah dan ingin menunggangi selalu ingin me manfaatkan momentum-momentum politik ini sebagai kesempatan mereka untuk membangun untuk melancarkan strategi mereka yang pada dasarnya strateginya adalah menciptakan kekacauan meruntuhkan tatanan karena sekali lagi kalau mereka minta khilafah berarti mereka harus runtuhkan tatanan yang ada ini kita nyatakan bahwa kita harus terima konstruksi baru ini karena ngotot kembali kepada konstruksi lama, konstruksi khilafah, itu tidak realistik. Sama sekali tidak realistis dan tidak bisa kita terima konsekuensi-konsekuensinya karena akan mendorong instabilitas, bahkan kekacauan, keos secara global yang akan meruntuhkan peradaban umat manusia seluruhnya. Why did the country's most important Muslim organization feel the need to make this point? What are the tensions around the interpretations of Islam in Indonesia? Cuman masih ada rezim yang sangat ketakutan dengan tegaknya syariat Islam. Nisa Alvis runs an Islamic boarding school in Pandeglang, about three hours' drive from capital Jakarta. 1,200 students study in the Darul Iman boarding school, which was established in 1991. Nisa inherited the school in 2015 after the death of her father. It teaches a syllabus or pisantren that goes beyond religious texts. Pesantren ini juga visinya ya dibangun tuh bagaimana untuk pemberdayaan. Ingin keadaan masyarakat dan lingkungan sekitar itu baik secara intelektualitas, secara ekonomi, budaya gitu kan. Melalui lembaga pendidikan. Masa itu lebih banyak pesantren-pesantren tradisional yang relatif lah pelajaran-pelajarannya uh, belum ada materi-materi yang di sekolah. Nah bahkan Abah itu mengganti kata modern, jadi nggak pakai pesantren modern ya, tapi pakainya pesantren terpadu untuk kayak epimisme gitu supaya lebih diterima oleh kalangan ulama lama yang mungkin keberatan dengan kata modern. Halo, Assalamualaikum, lagi apa? <laughs> Kalau basisnya yang konsep di pesantren ini, ya abah itu sangat inklusif ya, sehingga pastilah cita-citanya pun ingin agar santri-santri itu memiliki wawasan luas, mereka tuh bisa uh, bergaul di segala kalangan gitu ya, menerima perbedaan sebagai sunatullah. Kalau pesantren yang di sini dan banyak di pesantren modern lainnya saya tahu, itu yang ditanamkan itu ruh, semangat, spirit, hubul waton minal iman. gitu. Jadi cinta tanah air, bagian dari iman. Dan tanah air itu adalah ya, 
Indonesia yang majemuk ini gitu, bukan hanya Islam meskipun adanya di lembaga Islam, tapi diajarkan toleransi, diajarkan seni budaya, olahraga, pramuka, kepanduan ya kan. Jadi spirit kebangsaannya kuat gitu. But such progressive practices of Islam have been criticized by more hardline groups, groups like the Islamic Brotherhood Front. Islam adalah Islam rahmatan lil alamin yang sama-sama kita jaga. Nah, mungkin kelompok-kelompok mereka itu ya mungkin mereka tayayomi, terlindungi. Tapi mereka enggak pernah enggak bisa menyuarakan kebenaran. Enggak bisa menyuarakan yang hak-hak itu hak, yang batil itu batil. Mereka harus memelacurkan diri. Mereka harus betul-betul uh, menghancurkan harga diri mereka, menghancurkan nilai-nilai agama sehingga nilai-nilai sepertinya Islam yang kayak begitu mereka nyaman-nyaman saja. The Islamic Brotherhood Front or FPI is the spiritual successor of another group known as the Islamic Defenders Front, also abbreviated as FPI. The previous FPI was notorious for raiding bars and brothels during the fasting months intimidating non-practicing Muslims and attacking religious minorities. It was banned by the government in 2020 on the grounds that it threatened the national ideology Panchasila. Nearly 30 of its leaders, members and former members have been convicted on terrorism charges. But in 2021, it was revived under a new name, Islamic Brotherhood Front. Jadi FPI Front Persaudaraan Islam ini bukan reinkarnasi, memang sama eh, moto, misi, perjuangan, ADRT-nya boleh dikatakan hanya berubah-berubah dikit yang memang kita memperbaharui ya saja, memperbaharui daripada untuk betul-betul eh, kita memulai dari nol. Like its predecessor, this new FPI's mission is protecting what it perceives as the rights of the Muslim majority. Sampai saat ini saya sampaikan masih sangat jauh harapan dari apa yang kita rasakan saat ini. Justru semakin terpojokan nasib umat Islam makin tersingkirkan. Kita nggak pernah menolak daripada hilafah itu adalah kekafiran. Menolak daripada hilafah itu adalah kemurtatan. Menolak dari hilafah adalah haram. Tinggal mereka sebatas kajian atau mereka menerapkan dan menerapkan itu berbagai macam cara silahkan masing-masing. Yang penting mereka harus ada akui bahwa hilafah itu adalah ajan Islam, bahwa hilafah itu adalah rahmatan lil alamin. And this is an idea growing in popularity. A survey by Sharif Hidayatullah State Islamic University in 2021 shows 78.5% of high school students in 34 provinces support a caliphate, up from 63.1% in 2017. But why was the current iteration of FPI allowed to regroup? That is because in democratic Indonesia, setting up organizations is guaranteed by the constitution. In fact, when President Jokowi banned the previous FPI, a group which opposed him in the 2019 elections, the move was heavily criticized. That is considered violations of freedom of speech because he, the president did that only by, by a presidential edict. Uh, not through, you know, according to our law after reformasi that you have to go to the court to get a ruling whether you can ban a particular party or not. So actually, you know, that, that banning without the court ruling actually contributed to the slip, to the decline in Indonesia's democracy and freedom index. If you have undemocratic system, this kind of groups will go underground and that's when they can actually act in a way that is clandestine and, and in the long term could actually become much more dangerous. But it was not the first time the president acted against hardline groups. In 2017, the Indonesian branch of Hits Utahir was banned by a presidential decree. In 2018, 
Parliament approved tougher anti-terrorism laws that include powers to preemptively detain suspects for longer and prosecute those who join or recruit for militant groups. Dulu FPI dibubarkan itu kan karena mereka melakukan tindakan-tindakan anarkis, vandalisme, ya kan? Banyak sekali keluhan dari masyarakat karena itu dibubarkan. Sementara Hibut Tahrir Indonesia memang dia punya ideologi yang berbeda dengan Pancasila. Indonesia termasuk yang paling lambat melarang dan membubarkan Hizbut Tahrir karena di negara-negara Islam yang lain itu tidak boleh ada mereka diusir di mana-mana. Tapi di Indonesia dibiarkan terus baru kembali zaman Pak Jokowi yang Pak Jokowi ini punya keberanian yang luar biasa menurut saya. Dia membubarkan HTI, dia melarang Front Pembela Islam, kemudian dia juga mengganti undang-undang terorisme dengan undang-undang yang baru yang lebih kuat menurut saya itu. Sebuah gerakan itu susah banget kan untuk di Tumpas begitu aja hanya karena udah dilarang gitu ya. Karena spirit mereka masih hidup, orang-orang masih ada. Dan mereka memiliki hak untuk berubah nama gitu. Apapun namanya, kelompok Mawar Melati atau apa. Tapi dia ya lihat aja kalau memang ternyata uh, melakukan hal-hal yang sweeping dan lain-lain. Seperti yang mereka dahulu itu lakukan, ya udah larang aja lagi. <laughs> Kok pemerintah sungguh-sungguh ya memang harus tegas dan mengawal gitu. Silahkan semuanya baris. The current Islamic Brotherhood Front is quick to separate itself from the outlawed Islamic Defenders Front. But the differences are slim. It is led by the son-in-law of Habib Rizik Shihab, the old FPI's spiritual leader. And both groups want to enact Islamic laws in the country, rejecting Natlatu Ulama's vision of Islam Nusantara. Cuman masih ada rezim yang sangat ketakutan dengan tegaknya syarat Islam, dengan berdirinya mungkin negara Islam. Padahal kita ini mungkin yang mereka tergolong uh, konsen terhadap itu, mereka hanya berdakwah. Mereka nggak pernah melakukan apa-apa, mohon maaf seperti HTI. Nggak pernah ada melakukan aksi-aksi yang betul-betul bersandang dengan konstitusi. Jadi kalau secara umum ada mereka membelah. Membelah, memecah belah Islam. Kalau yang kelompok mereka, yang boleh dikatakan pro rezim, ya mungkin mereka nyaman-nyaman saja. Tapi itu bukan mewakili umat Islam dan itu bukan Islam yang sebenarnya. Bukan Islam yang kafah. Mohon maaf, mereka bagi. Akhirnya mereka mengkelompokkan sendiri. Dengan nama sebutan Islam Nusantara. Islam-Islam satu, nggak ada Islam Nusantara. Lagu kebangsaan Indonesia Raya. Nonetheless, with hundreds of thousands of members, these groups represent an attractive voting bloc to politicians. At stake then is the shifting definition of what moderate Islam looks like in Indonesia. There are very strong elements within political parties that want to impose their idea on conservatism. That has been also transformed into a regulations, including what they call PERDA, yeah? regional regulation at the local level. That require people to comply with certain rules of Islam, which is, in my opinion, you know, it's a bit too much, you know. Why? Because Indonesia does not belong to one single religion. This is what you call creeping, you know, Islamization or Syriahization. Then Indonesia will not be Indonesia anymore because the Indonesian national motto is unity in diversity. If the majority oppresses the minority, then the social political contract of Indonesia would be torn apart. Indonesia could be engulfed in endless conflicts. Should the moderates fail to uphold the principles of Pancasila and tolerance, who could face the consequences? Late Saturday afternoon in Jakarta. A group of textile lovers gather in a local boutique. They don their best traditional blouses and batik fabrics and hold a mini fashion show. Pakai ini, itu motifnya adalah uh, tampuk manggis 
Nah ini ada simbolnya itu simbol kejujuran dan kerendahan hati. Juga memiliki arti bahwa kalau kita melihat sesuatu atau melihat seseorang itu jangan hanya dari luarnya saja. The group was founded over their love for batik, a traditional Indonesian fabric that traces its roots back a thousand years. Batik is widely worn by Indonesians regardless of ethnicity and religion, a symbol of its common identity. But as Islamic dress codes become more popular in the country, Sisi and Drisa Makalo and her friends worry about the erosion of Indonesian culture. Islam moderat itu adalah Islam yang tetap uh, berdampingan bersama dengan budaya, tidak terpisah, tetap uh, menerima bahwa budaya itu adalah asli Indonesia. Yang kami khawatirkan cara berpakaian yang sesuai dengan budaya Indonesia itu semakin lama semakin hilang. Maka dari itu uh, kami mendirikan komunitas ini untuk kembali lagi menggunakan wastra untuk kegiatan sehari-hari, untuk uh, bekerja. Sebagaimana kita ketahui kan masuknya Islam ke Indonesia itu juga melalui budaya. Ya, melalui tari-tarian, melalui wayang, melalui batik, seperti itu. Kalau misalnya sampai itu punah, amat sangat disayangkan. Hilanglah keberagaman, hilanglah bineka tunggal ika. It was on this basis that Natlatu Ulama, the country's biggest Muslim organization, was founded a hundred years ago, based on the Islamic calendar. It sought to contextualize Islam within Indonesia's cultural identity and reject the more fundamentalist Salafist movement. For leaders of NU, maintaining this moderate stance is a constant struggle. Di Indonesia sendiri ini saya ingat mungkin sejak sejak tahun 70-an, 80-an ada wacana tentang Islam moderat. Tapi apa hasilnya sampai sekarang? Apakah masalah-masalah konflik antar agama ini bisa diselesaikan. Ternyata tidak. While Islam is the dominant religion in Indonesia, about 13% of its population do not adhere to the faith. That works out to around 35 million people. Indonesia's constitution protects all religions. But for leaders of minority faiths, like Jimmy Sormin, a turn towards conservatism can be alarming. Konservatisme itu uh, terjadi pada kelompok-kelompok agama ya. Tidak hanya di agama Islam, di Kristen, di kelompok-kelompok lain pun ada berpotensi demikian. Nah di Indonesia, kalau dianggap konservatisme itu bertumbuh, ya, ya benar. Dan, tapi itu juga secara sporadis, nah, ada banyak kepentingan secara politis yang secara instan, yang secara temporer untuk memenangkan agenda tertentu dan mengorbankan keberagaman kita, keharmonisan di tengah masyarakat kita. Dan ini yang harus kita kawal bersama. While tolerance is a federal decree, things are sometimes different at the regional level. The reforms and democratization of Indonesia mean that local governments have some autonomy in managing their own affairs. They can implement laws that favor one religion or another. For example, some states have made the headdress mandatory for schoolgirls in defiance of the federal government. Hanya memang ketika era otonomi daerah ini terjadi, Banyak daerah dengan kepemimpinan atau politik daerahnya yang sangat uh, mendukung kelompok-kelompok ideologi tertentu, keagaman tertentu, mencoba untuk memenangkan regulasi setempat agar berpihak pada kelompok-kelompok tertentu. One expression of this is how minority places of worship are treated. In a study by Human Rights Advocacy Group, Satara Institute, 50 houses of worships, mostly churches, were the target of disturbances in 2022, up threefold from 16 cases in 2017. Satara defines disturbances as destruction, demolition, or opposing the construction of houses of worship. 
ada undang-undang ya, ada SKB, Surat Keputusan Bersama Menteri Dalam Negeri dan Menteri Agama bahwa pendirian rumah ibadah itu harus disetujui oleh 90 orang jamaahnya yang akan menggunakan tempat ibadah tersebut dan plus 60 orang di lingkungan itu itu sebenarnya sangat susah sangat sulit ya sangat sulit kenapa? karena kita sulit sekali membayangkan 60 orang yang setuju bahwa di daerahnya akan ada pembangunan gereja misalnya saya kira susah itu artinya aturan itu dibuat memang untuk mempersulit pembangunan gereja if there are no regulations it could actually lead to social conflict so the idea is that you know that it should be regulated uh, but Regulation is meant to ensure that once it is built, it is not uh, opposed uh, or attacked uh, by those who, who do not like that, that you know, that the presence of that different uh, places of worship. The devil's a detail now, you know, we need to look very carefully at how it is implemented. Not, it should not be used to discriminate again. Eric Fernando is the executive director of the Indonesian Buddhist Intellectual Association, a group of Buddhist scholars. He's also of Chinese descent. Practicing his faith means having a certain level of discretion. Di dalam CRCR atau mungkin pengajaran uh, Dharma, ajaran Sang Buddha, misalkan dalam buku-buku yang kita cetak, nah itu biasanya kita masukkan di sana bahwa ditulis untuk kalangan sendiri. Artinya memang buku ini diterbitkan bukan untuk berusaha meyakinkan orang lain untuk memeluk agama kita. Mungkin seperti itu kira-kira contoh praktik aturan-aturan tidak tertulis di dalam memeluk agama Buddha di Indonesia. In Central Java stands Borobudur Temple, the world's largest Buddhist monument. It was constructed between 750 and 850 BCE, long before Islam came to the archipelago. Built from two million blocks of stone, the bas reliefs tell the story of Buddha as well as life in Java during the period. While a source of pride of the Buddhist community, the temple also stands as a reminder of the limits of religious freedom. Contoh hal lain, misalkan bagaimana Kalau kami umat Buddha ingin pergi ke tempat ibadah kami sendiri yaitu Candi Borobudur, setiap kali kami mau bikin kegiatan itu kami harus mengajukan izin yang mekanismenya begitu luar biasa dan membayar biaya sewa yang juga uh, mungkin secara harga juga luar biasa. Jadi bisa dibayangkan bagaimana umat Buddha mau beribadah ke tempat yang didirikan oleh leluhurnya Itu di Indonesia ini kita mesti bayar. Current President Joko Widodo has treaded a centrist line, warning against a turn towards fundamentalism, emphasizing the importance of Pancasila. Kalau di pusat saya kira Pak Jokowi sudah jelas sekali sikapnya sangat tegas, ya kan? Dia bilang ini hati-hati, hati-hati kemarin itu dia bilang kan, semua orang beragama di Indonesia punya hak untuk beribadah sesuai dengan keyakinannya. Tinggal di bawahnya ini, aparat-aparat di bawahnya melaksanakan atau tidak. Pemerintah itu harus satu suara ya. Kalau di atasnya Pak Jokowi sudah seperti itu, aparat di bawahnya juga harus seperti itu. Kalau tidak, itu namanya kan insubordinasi, pembangkangan. Daripada itu kami menilai bahwa pemerintah sudah melakukan upaya-upaya baik secara formal maupun secara informal Bagaimana pluralisme dan kerukunan ini terus kita jaga, terus kita perhatikan dengan baik untuk menjaga Pancasila di Indonesia ini. But with Jokowi's term ending, what Pancasila and diversity mean could be renegotiated under a new leader. And in a country of 17,000 islands and 1,300 ethnic groups, these are ideas that hold together the archipelago's social fabric. Don't forget that parts of Indonesia, the eastern part of Indonesia, for example, there are Christians, uh, where the Muslims are not necessarily the majority. In Papua, the Muslims are the minority. In, ba in Bali, the Muslims are minorities. In North Sulawesi, the Muslims are minorities. So if 
in the western part of Indonesia, the Muslim majority behave cruelly towards their non-Muslim minorities, the same thing can happen uh, in the eastern parts of Indonesia. And that would really be very, very painful for Indonesia. With the presidential elections looming, will moderate Islam prevail amidst the politicking? It's Eid al-Fitr, the end of the fasting month of Ramadan. A day of celebration for millions of Muslims in Indonesia. Mazwi, the caretaker of the Loa Batang Mosque, is making sure it's ready to receive worshippers on this special day. Kemana karena kita sebulan full di tempat batin kita supaya menahan lapar haus karena untuk bayar merasakan juga bagaimana penceritaan saudara-saudara kita yang memang notabene kurang apa asupan makanan baik gizi dan sebagainya itu. Ida Fitar, which is also called Lebaran in Indonesia, is celebrated across the country with a feast and new clothes. As someone who has performed the Hajj, the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca, Mazwi is respected by his neighbors. In Indonesia, it is not uncommon for non-Muslims to take part in Eid celebrations. Jadi memang kalau bicara kebinekaan, kalau menurut saya sih di kampung saya terutama ya udah bagus sih. Dalam arti meskipun ada yang non-Muslim dari etnis Cina, etnis lain sebagainya. Karena sudah berbaur dan mereka pun menghormati satu sama lain akidah kita gitu. Selama kita juga enggak apa namanya enggak menyinggung apa yang mereka anut. Makanya itulah sampai sekarang sampai saya sekarang ini ada di sini tuh enggak pernah terjadi hal-hal yang kita enggak inginkan. This image of a majority Muslim Indonesia, one which is tolerant inclusive and diverse is something that Natlatu Ulama wants to spread beyond the country's borders. As it approached its 100th year, Natlatu Ulama organized the Group of Twenties' first religious forum ahead of the Leaders' Summit in Bali in November last year. The forum aimed to encourage discussions among global religious leaders to find solutions to religious extremism. The location was a poignant one. It was the 20th anniversary of the Bali bombing, carried out by terrorist group Jamaa Islamia. Di situ kemudian muncul uh, uh, diskusi yang luar biasa menarik karena jujur. <laughs> karena diskusi kalau tidak jujur memang tidak menarik. Jadi, <laughs> jadi para pemain agama akhirnya menyadari bahwa ternyata kita memang selama ini Ya, pada era-era peradaban yang lalu, ya kita memang berkonflik dan konflik antar agama pada era peradaban yang lalu itu dijustifikasi di dalam uh, wawasan keagamaan masing-masing. As Indonesia gears up for the presidential election in February 2024, will it continue to be the example of tolerance? Can politicians resist the call of identity politics? Masih uh, sangat mungkin uh, terulang ya, apa yang kita alami di masa lalu. Nah, maka sejak awal sebetulnya kita sudah terus menerus memperingatkan masyarakat tentang bahaya ini. Bahkan saya sampaikan bahwa kalau ada politisi yang masih uh, memanfaatkan uh, identitas sebagai senjata untuk menggalang dukungan, 
Ya pada dasarnya dia boleh dikata sudah menipu konstituennya ya, dengan eh, eh, katakanlah imajinasi yang yang palsu. Kalau ada politisi misalnya berteriak-teriak membela Islam, membela Islam, apanya dari Islam yang yang tidak dia bela gitu. Dan eh, apa yang mungkin dia bisa lakukan untuk itu, ini semuanya hal yang hanya me- memanipulasi emosi dan kecenderungan identitas tanpa memberikan, menawarkan ya, tanpa menawarkan visi-visi yang rasional. Dan itu tidak sehat. Orang yang teriak tentang anti politik identitas itu sebenarnya dia menerahkan politik identitas diri sendiri karena nggak ada partai yang nggak punya identitas identitas PDI apa demokrasi identitas poli partai-partai yang lain adalah nasionalis mungkin religius nah orang justru menghilangkan identitas itu adalah sebenarnya adalah menyerang Islam karena kita nggak bisa dilepaskan dari identitas kita manapun ini identitas The 2019 contest has been a major test for Jacobi as he sought re-election. Disinformation, known as hoaxes in Indonesia, stoked ethnic and religious tensions. Some hardline groups accused Jacobi of being anti-Islam, throwing their support behind his challenger, Prabowo Subianto. Jacobi cannot run again in 2024. that Prabowo is expected to throw his hat in the ring. Among his challengers are Central Java Governor Ganja Pranowo and former Jakarta Governor Anis Baswedan. Anis won the gubernatorial race in 2017 with support from conservative Muslim groups after his Christian contender Basuki Chahaya Purnama or Ahok was accused of blasphemy. Identity politics, part of politics, you know, uh, that will be made into an issue. Um, but we have seen, you know, the, the worst was during the gubernatorial election in Jakarta, as if Indonesia is going to break up. And then, you know, during the presidential election between Pak Jokowi and Pak Prabowo, and then 2019 again. But after that, all of these elites got back together, and Pak Prabowo joined the cabinet. So I think the the people on the ground should be smart enough to say not to take politics too hard you know and uh, it is i hope that the uh, political elites uh, will not make cheap use of identities which, which could be very damaging very polarizing just to score points kalau politik identitasnya sendiri per definisi itu kan ada masalah karena politik identitas di zaman postmodernisme memang muncul di mana-mana kan Feminisme itu politik identitas, LGBT itu politik identitas, ya. etik itu politik identitas. Yang masalah itu ketika dia dipolitisasi untuk mencapai tujuan kekuasaan itu, apalagi atas nama agama, karena sentimen agama itu gampang sekali menyulut uh, kemarahan. The fear then is not that widespread religious conflagration will occur in Indonesia. Instead. As politicians lean into populism, the danger is of a slow, creeping erosion of the state ideology Pancasila. Kalau Pancasila tidak dipertahankan, tentu kita pemeluk agama Buddha di Indonesia khawatir bisa terjadi mungkin satu gejolak-gejolak baik secara sosial, politik, nantinya akan berimbas kepada praktik beragama di Indonesia. Misalkan mungkin uh, kebebasan di dalam beribadah, ke- hak dan kewajiban untuk saling beribadah dan lain sebagainya. Nah, ini mungkin nanti bisa lebih agak tertekan ya kalau tidak dijadikan Pancasila sebagai dasar negara. Sudah seharusnya pemerintah menegakkan bersama apa yang sudah dijamin oleh konstitusi terhadap kebinekaan kita. Artinya perlu pembelajaran yang tegas juga terhadap persoalan-persoalan di mana adanya tindakan-tindakan yang diskriminatif oleh negara terhadap warganya itu satu pelanggaran yang tidak boleh dianggap remeh. This is the season where presidential hopefuls announce the candidacy. The cancellation of the Under 20 World Cup is a reminder for the country to brace itself for another volatile leadership contest. But many place their hope 
on a bulwark against more extremist tendencies. A bulwark made up of Indonesia's silent, moderate majority. Kelompok yang namanya kelompok moderat, kelompok progresif, mereka itu adalah uh, silent majority ya. Mereka itu tidak akan bicara secara asertif atau agresif. Mereka itu nunggu kasus aja, nunggu isu aja. Kalau tidak ada isu ya mereka diam saja, mereka bekerja. Tapi nanti begitu ada isu mereka akan bicara gitu, sesuai yang dibutuhkan. Saya kira itu sudah benar lah. When I was in Norway, when I tried to explain, you know, how complex Indonesian society is, yeah, it 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 is not easy, you know, because they used to read all the news from Middle East, you know, all the conflicts, all the violence, yeah, that take place in Middle East countries in Syria, in uh, Afghanistan, in all these countries. That, that, that is the perception on Islam. But I told them, Indonesia has been very peaceful for, since they proclaimed their independence. Yes, there are issues of violence in certain places, yeah, but I don't think it is that significant to consider Indonesia as a violent state. But again, you know, Indonesia needs to speak up more. Indonesia uh, needs to reach out. I, I told Nahdlatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah when I uh, nominated them to win the Nobel Peace, yeah, speak up.